Welcome to another video. Today I'm trying something completely different. I am actually trying a synthesis that I've never tried before. I've never done this, period. And what I'm making today is some sulfur trioxide. This is something that I have been wanting to make for a long time. And I did not have any uh, platinum catalyst to do it. And then I found a way that you can do it just from some sodium bisulfate reduction where you reduce the sodium bisulfate and uh, so you basically get two decomposition products um, you have two moles of sodium bisulfate I uh, you just use an arbitrary amount for this I scooped out a scoop that happened to be 43 and a half grams on the dot so that's what I have in here and I'm heating it and we want to heat it up to around 350 C and as I was saying, you get two decomp products, one of which is sodium pyrosulfate. And then, as you can see here, we get water that comes out of the sodium bisulfate. Uh, I believe it's like a trihydrate. I'm not really sure exactly. have to look up the SDS on it. Um, so, this is the first step in progress here. This is getting our intermediate, which is the sodium pyrosulfate. And then uh, once this is completely all reduced, and uh, or I guess uh, yeah, I guess reduced down, um, decomposed anyhow, uh, then we will move on to the next step, which is then again heating up the pyrosulfate uh, to about 450C, to where we actually are um, going to decompose it further. And that will yield, if everything goes according to the literature that I am reading, and this was from a forum that I found on Science Madness on how to make this just from OTC materials. Um, so, uh, yeah, if it goes by uh, the way that the synthesis on there read, it should yield us some sodium sulfate and our SO3. So, wish me luck, and I'll be back. Okay, so I just wanted to update you guys. As you see, I've got a little bit different of a setup going on here, and it's because I ran out of propane. And I probably should have used this little guy in the first place because it is propane and butane fuel mixed, so it's a little bit more efficient, but whatever. Uh, really, the thing I wanted to show you guys was if you could see it through all the steam coming off there. Eh, you might be able to see it better through this way. As you can see on the top, there is starting to form some crystals. And that is our target intermediate product, that is our pyrosulfate forming. And it's starting to crash out just because uh, we are dehydrating this enough that uh, you know it's uh, able to precipitate out because of the lack of water volume. Uh, it is, uh, I'm running this a little bit hot. You only need to get up to about 320C. I'm between 340 and 350 and that is just because I can't really turn my burner down any further and for the beaker I'm using I don't have any kind of a clamp that's big enough to suspend it above the flame at all uh, that's not going to hurt anything though um, you could uh, you know you can do this pretty much up to whatever temperature you want to because what we're doing is, we're, you know, this is a decomposition reaction, so it, it's only going to decompose so far, and the farthest it will decompose is to the sodium pyrosulfate, which is what we want. So temperature doesn't really matter, and uh, I'll obviously get rid of all of the water a lot faster the hotter it is. So I guess it's working in my favor. You can also see on the sides of the beaker there, there's a bunch of uh, pyrosulfate that is already formed that's just from you know where I stirred it around and it kind of sloshed against the sides of the beaker so just wanted to show you how this is coming along and uh, I will come back once our intermediate product is all ready all right so here is what we've got we're looking at our pyrosulfate right here and as you can see here we've got a yield of 38.8 grams 
of bone dry flakes. So the next thing to do is to just crush this up and get it so it will uh, react a little bit more nicely. And uh, I'm just going to do that by crushing it up in the pestle and mortar. There's really not enough to worry about using the coffee grinder here for. So I'm going to go ahead and get this all crushed up and we'll go from there. All right, so I got a stir bar. I got a 250 milliliter round bottom flask here. There's a stir bar in there. We have 20 grams of our product in there. And so I am going to add in about two milliliters of 98% sulfuric acid. Now, as far as the literature says, the uh, amount of water that is in this will potentially reduce your yield if you have it any more than just 2% water. So you really want to use the 98% sulfuric acid for this. Um, if all you have is some drain cleaner acid, I recommend distilling it first. Um, if, well, I mean you can't really do this if you don't have a distillation apparatus. So I was going to say maybe clean it up a little bit with some peroxide and then boil that off. But, uh, you know, we're going to have to set this up for simple distillation here in a minute. So it's kind of stupid of me to even think of suggesting that. So, yeah, so you need to distill your acid first or just buy the 98%, uh, but I recommend just getting drain cleaner and distilling it because the 98%, if you buy it, it is roughly 100 US um, per liter. So it's not the cheapest thing in the world. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to set this up for simple distillation here. And uh, I'm just going to uh, have a scrubber with a little bit of sulfuric acid. Uh, and I'm just going to use um, about 90% sulfuric acid in the scrubber. Um, you don't want to let any of this go into the atmosphere because it is not good for the environment. Um, I'm pretty sure that sulfur trioxide is a good bit of what uh, creates the acidity and acid rain so that's a little bit about why you need a scrubber for this and uh, it's highly corrosive too so anything in your shop or in your lab that you're working around that's metal or uh, sensitive to oxidation it, it will definitely corrode very quickly with the uh, fumes for this so uh, let me get set up here and I'll be back All right, so here's the setup going on. Here, just got a regular stow head. You don't need a thermometer for this. I'm not gonna be running any water in the condenser and that's because um, this likes to solidify at a very low temperature. I believe it's at around 16 degrees C. Uh, so if we put any cold water through this, uh, we're gonna end up clogging up our condenser. Um, I might end up actually putting some warm water through this. We're going to have to see how it goes. Like I said, never done this before. And right down here under our receiver, you can see here I've got my washing bottle with some 90% sulfuric in it. And the reason I'm using sulfuric to uh, scrub this gas is because uh, the uh, any sulfur trioxide that escapes is going to essentially turn that into... Uh, an oleum and uh, that's pretty much what I'm using the sulfur trioxide for anyhow so it'll just give us a more concentrated sulfuric acid uh, there won't be any reactions there at all um, so uh, we need to go ahead and turn on our heat turn on our stirring and let it rip so here you can see the first bit of sulfur trioxide making its way over hasn't quite reached the condenser yet but you can see all this white wispy vapor smoke that is our sulfur trioxide that's what it should look like it should just look like a white smoke and it will if everything goes according to plan it will travel down the condenser won't clog up my condenser for me on the way there and we will have a nice uh, solid down here. Um, 
Now, something I should mention that the paper on this did uh, mention that uh, it might be a little disconcerting here is that uh, if there's any organic residue or any um, residue of joint grease at all in any of this, it will start to turn black as this will oxidize it and it will basically just turn it to carbon. So our product that should be a white powder in here might end up having a little bit of a yellow to a brown to a black tinge to it and that is okay. Um, all we need to do if that happens is basically uh, we can redistill it or just use it as is. It all depends on what you're going to use it for. If you don't mind a little bit of carbon contamination in there, then it's not a problem. You can use it, you know, right how it goes. But uh, if that ends up happening here, I think I'm going to redistill it. Um, maybe even try to fractionate it, see if that helps anything. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So. You know, I think to help this along, and just so that I don't get it clogging up there in the mouth of the condenser, I'm going to insulate this with some foil. And uh, once we start collecting some product, I will show you what that looks like here. Okay, so my first little bit, after running this for about 20 minutes here, is coming through the condenser now you can see the gas going right there and it's puffing down into the takeoff receiver and you can see here it's filling up in there quite nicely and that will eventually solidify and that's still pretty cool to the touch so I'm not gonna worry about it right now I may end up actually putting the receiving flask in an ice bath uh, to try to get that to condense and solidify a little bit quicker however um, yeah it's about uh, 48 degrees Fahrenheit right now so the ambient temperature I think should be plenty enough uh, to take care of solidifying this um, if I don't start to see some crystallization soon though I think I will definitely put it into an ice bath so that's what we have here after about, like I said, it's been probably 20, maybe 30 minutes. I haven't really been paying attention to the clock so much. I've had issues up here, so this is kind of of note to you. If you can see that smoke coming off of there, I do not have a leak in my apparatus. What was starting to happen is, you can see there, the rubber on my clamp was starting to uh, deteriorate. And I don't have any... Uh, just solid metal clamps, so I just ended up having to loosen that up and uh, I think I'm gonna have to loosen it up even more and you can also see there in the neck there is some of that oxidation of uh, residual grease, joint grease that was in there so I've got that going on um, the only real issue I had was I had to adjust the clamp and you can see a little bit right in here there is a tiny bit of something and I think probably I'm usually pretty damn careful about cleaning my condensers that's probably a tiny little bit of um, acetone residue in there so I will have a little bit of contamination going on it's disappointing but you know I kind of expected that to happen so no biggie and it did mention that in the literature for this reaction so nothing to do now but just sit back and wait alright so two things here uh, first of all of note I did put this in a nice bath however the most important thing here and this was a fundamental tactical error on my part I had to switch out my heating apparatuses and this is simply because my heating mantle, uh, and I should have known this, is not hot enough to get this reaction going. Uh, we need to get up to around 450, 460 C, and my heating mantle only gets up to about 380. 
Um, so I've been sitting here waiting this whole time for about an hour. Uh, it got up there, you know, we saw some gases coming over and then it just stopped and nothing. So I finally figured out like, oh, I'm pretty stupid here. So uh, that's really the main thing then is I switched my heating devices. So we got to go to an open flame here. If you've got a heating mantle that will sustain those types of temperatures, by all means use it. So the other thing of note here is uh, stir bar wasn't a good idea and I should have known that as well. I have killed my stir bar. The temperatures are just too high for it and it completely demagnetized it. You can actually see it is just starting to liquefy right now. Uh, if I can get an angle on it, you can actually see right through the stir bar. So you're looking at the magnet right there. Uh, so I hope uh, it shouldn't matter because we don't have any metals in there. So the uh, PTFE presence I don't think is going to hurt anything. Um, however, I just don't know. So really hoping this doesn't decide to explode on me. I think I might actually take a magnet and uh, pull that up onto the side, kind of get it up out of the way so it's out of the direct heat. So don't use a stir bar, use some heat source that'll get you up to 450 and uh, <laughs> yeah.